Hello, welcome to the fourth talk of Human Factors and Design. I'm Joseph Jackerman, and today we'll be talking about a very important topic in human factors and ergonomics, which is the issue of posture, meaning the position of the body with respect to its environment and the activities that are being performed. Now, in uh, previous talks, we discussed a series of issues related to anthropometry, which is the science of the measurement of the human body, and we discussed many aspects of biomechanics, particularly in relation to muscles and joints and the back and so forth. So we raised a large number of issues and it can seem a bit overwhelming from a design perspective to ask questions about all these different issues related to people and will the smaller people have different problems from the larger people and so forth and so on. Fortunately, there are tools and references and, and things coming to our rescue for doing the design work. One uh, big category of uh, opportunities and supports and tools for design are all the various standards, guidelines, recommendations from di different sources, from national bodies, professional bodies, uh, governmental agencies and so forth. There's a wide array of requirements which must be met from a design point of view. And there's also quite a large number, even more, of uh, recommendations which may not be required, but if something goes wrong, that would be the reference for the best practice which people will check it against. So what kinds of requirements, recommendations, constraints, legal requirements are we talking about? Well, for example, taking some data from some uh, North American United States military specifications, Dimensional requirements uh, are present in a wide range of documents for situations such as these. For example, a hallway in case of a fire. People need to get out. People can bump into each other. The, the width and the size of the hallway are very influential in terms of how quickly a person can leave a building. Uh, machinery spaces such as the example on the left of the diagram, might be in a submarine between the bulkhead and the batteries, might be in some surface ship, might be in an aircraft in one of the working spaces. Um, these are all topics which usually there's uh, suggestions, recommendations, and in some cases in purchasing decisions there are probably going to be formal requirements in the product design specifications. Here are some examples where some dimensions are recommended. In other examples, for example, taking mil standard, military standard HDBK 758, this is talking about uh, access and escape hatches, uh, if you're going to build or design, excuse me, military equipment for the United States military, these are the kinds of dimensions you would have to take as a reference and respect as part of your design. Lots of uh, re re recommendations exist with, ex with respect to access panels. Think of the last time you took a commercial airliner from Heathrow Airport and you saw one of the aircraft on the runway being checked its engines, its turbines, for some reason doing a routine check. Well, when you design such sophisticated uh, instruments as a turbine engine or the landing gear or some of the electronic equipment, the avionics on an aircraft, you're packing vast amounts of equipment and machinery into very small spaces. So questions of what is the access panel size to permit a person with their hand to go in and adjust something or to check a valve setting or to look to see if some electrical connectors are fully in place and, and looking appropriate and healthy. Questions of access panels are incredibly important. 
and finding the space for this is incredibly difficult and very expensive with, uh, with modern equipments. So there will be, as in this case, a series of request requirements, sometimes legal requirements put in writing, that you must guarantee certain access sizes because if this is not the case, when this is not provided, the equipment may work properly from an engineering point of view in its main function, but if you can't check it easily, if you can't maintain it easily, if minor operations become difficult for the human mechanics, for the human technicians, for the human pilots inside the aircraft, that's when accidents occur and very bad things can happen. So there are legal binding requirements on things like this. Now, postures. What kind of postures are we thinking about in design? Well, let's begin by talking about the two main types of posture, or two main categories, and let's look at a couple of recommendations which are available. Books and books are available. I, I uh, recommend, suggest, I stimulate that you check on the internet and look in the library at resources in these areas because there's large amounts of information and many guidelines available. However, let's just discuss a little bit some of the basics to try to clarify the semantics, the words we're using. Two main postures, standing and sitting. Standing posture, used in the workplace when either sitting is not possible or more frequently when large areas of work surface are involved and or large forces need to be produced. If I have to work something, maybe a piece of wood on a table, I might need to put, as they say, my back into it and put a lot of force using my upper body, pushing with all the muscles of the upper body to do something. If I have to assemble something, I might have to produce significant forces again with my upper body to force the two mechanical components together. When these situations arise, usually it's the case that a standing posture is recommended because when you're sitting down, your lower body is out of the picture. You can't use your legs as part of the push to get a force on something. So a lot of factory, workplace, assembly line, a lot of outside in the farming environment, in agriculture, a lot of activities are going to be specified for the standing posture. And in an industrial setting, standing postures need to be described. And there will be different recommendations and different suggestions and perhaps on occasion different requirements, formal legal requirements, based on the nature of the work. The most basic description, which is present in many standards and many documents, you will describe the work as being either precision work, light assembly work, or heavy work. The definitions are here on the slide, fairly common sense. You might be assembling an electrical component or looking through a magnifier and working. Perhaps you're in Switzerland, the Char du Fond, working on a watch, making a very complex, expensive, high quality watch. Those, of course, would be precision works, light assembly are the types of things we see on television occurring in the uh, hardware, electronic factories, electronic environments. And then heavy work, of course, are when some of the components or some of the work is mechanical in nature, assembling a gearbox in a factory. There may be some steps of the process which are manual rather than robotic, and that would be considered heavy work. For each of these postures, if you're using a table or a workbench or some sort of surface, there will be guidelines, there will be requirements. Uh, one set of guidelines taken from one source, there's a variety of them, is the one that's shown here. Precision work, light assembly work, heavy work. The recommendation is you should be keeping the work a certain distance below your elbow so that you can bend your hands up and down enough to lift and close things and move things around. And 
for males and females uh, broken by gender, we will see different table heights specified. Why do postural recommendations, just like anthropometric data tables, break the data in, by gender, by male or female? As we mentioned in the talk about anthropometrics, that's because the Gaussian distribution, the bell-shaped curve, which we obtain from measuring a group of males or boys or a group of girls, females, we will see that they tend to be different. They tend to be slightly uh, offset, so we end up with a bimodal distribution. So we tend to treat one group and the other group separately, measure them, model them, consider them separately, then that leads to slightly different heights for the table. And of course, if you have a work environment where many different people of both genders uh, are working on these uh, tables or these surfaces, you will have to come to some compromise decisions. Or as we said in the chapter on anthropometry, you will need to build adjustments into the table so people can move the surface up and down. So the standing posture, very common still today, but of course most of us are working these days in office type settings or in some sort of a vehicle context. You tend to be seeing a lot more of the seated posture than you would have 50 or 100 years ago. The seated posture has some advantages. Uh, because you're only free to move your upper body, you can tend to control your hand a little better. If you need to write or draw or sketch, usually the seated posture gives you a steadier hand and better hand control. Uh, but the seated posture means that uh, you uh, have also some drawbacks. Uh, you have less possibility to push on things. You can't use your legs. To gain force when you're trying to generate force. So you have better upper body control, better hand fine control of hands and limbs, a little bit less ability to generate forces. Seated posture, just like the standing posture, there's going to be a set of recommendations. Here we have uh, one source of recommendations, many books, many standards will provide recommendations. This is just an example. Fine work, precision work, light assembly, uh, desk work, uh, and so forth. We have the types of heights for the work surfaces which are recommended. And again, as usual, and, I, and I've been repeating this over and over just to make sure it's not confusing, the tables do tend to be separated by gender because we end up with average values or mean values significantly different between groups of males and females. Another consideration related to the surface height that occurs in the seated posture particularly, which quite often comes into play, it's important to consider, is the question of how the surface height will affect your use of the backrest of the chair you're using. Now in the standing posture, you can adjust your body position quite freely. It's a very different context. But in a chair, you have a backrest. The backrest is intended to take some weight off of your lumbar region of your spine. If, however, the surface of your desk or in a lecture theater at the university, the surface of the little tray or table that's provided next to the seat. If those are very low, you will find yourself to do some writing or to do something on your cell phone or on your laptop. You will find yourself leaning over, taking your back off the backrest, which puts the weight back on your lumbar spine. So whereas the backrest will take a certain percentage of your upper body mass and your upper body weight, take that and hold it for you through friction on the backrest. If you lean forward, the more you lean, the more that puts on your lower spine, particularly the lumbar region. This can lead to back problems, uh, a bit of uh, fatigue, possibly pain, and in the long term, back problems if uh, this is significant and going on for long periods of time. So as a designer, you need to ask yourself some questions about 
not just the control of the hand, not just the task you're doing, but also if there's any possibility there's effect on your back as well. And finally, the seated posture usually comes into play with what? With vehicles or with desks in offices. In either case, there's more to it than simply uh, reaching things and using the area and using your hand and checking whether you're coming off the backrest. Minimum, there's a question with office desks and occasionally also with some vehicles of whether you have enough space underneath the work surface to not bump your knee, as is being shown in this image. Uh, you can bump your knee or upper leg. If there isn't sufficient free space under the work surface, we now have a comfort problem which leads to fatigue and discomfort and possibly eventually pain and long-term problems due to the lack of space for your lower limbs. There's also the very important issue of what you're looking at and what's the viewing angle. If you have to spend your day looking down at a screen or looking down at some sheet of paper, this causes you to bend your neck forward. If you need to do that for more than a couple of minutes, neck pain and upper back pain will immediately ensue. If you're looking up, if you're an operator on a military aircraft and there's some sort of a screen such as a radar or a situation awareness display above the line of sight with the horizon you're looking out your window, but there's actually some display on the ceiling or the roof of the aircraft, looking up like this, again, after a couple minutes in this angle, try it, you will realize there is some pain occurring. And if you have to do that on a military aircraft doing a surveillance flight over the North Atlantic for 12 hours, you may have serious neck problems by the end of the mission. So it's very important with the seating uh, position to consider the wider range of issues. It is a much more complicated scenario. There's less freedom for the operator to adjust their body posture. Thus, there's much more responsibility on the designer, on the human factors and ergonomics expert, to check the figures and make sure it works for the range of people that are imagined or specified for that particular situation. Now, general recommendations, they could seem a bit trivial, but it's important to be fully clear and complete and state them. Foot operation. Those controls on machines which are assigned to the foot are assigned because, yes, the foot and the leg are slower, heavier, less accurate, and so forth than the hand. The leg is bigger, it's slower, there's limits to what it can do. But the lower limb is very good at generating high forces. It's no coincidence that on an automobile your brake pedal and your clutch pedal are down on the floor. Nowadays, uh, vehicles use electromechanical systems, power servers, and so forth, and servos, and so forth, and so on. So today, in theory, you could completely rearrange the controls of a vehicle in many different ways, and they would work possibly even better than what we usually see. However, the very first automobiles, before there was power steering, power brakes, servo assisted, whatever, it was heavy and it was hard to do. Pull, pushing the brakes on a Model T Ford required a strong person and quite a bit of effort. So, once upon a time, these early vehicles, simple mechanical systems with levers, pulleys, and gears, we put the heavy, the designers put the heavy, uh, controls down on the floor and things a little bit lighter, the steering to some degree, but certainly secondary controls such as today the radio, the infotainment system, windshield wipers, uh, heating and air conditioning and so forth. All of these uh, controls which do not require substantial force generation to actuate them carefully, those tended to be assigned 
to the hand, because the hand, of course, is rather precise and rapid. Foot operation, when you're designing any kind of equipment, machine, or road vehicle, there are standard guidelines and recommendations. For example, the knee angle is generally recommended to not go too far beyond your range from 105 to 110 degrees in the case of a vehicle where you have servo assistance and you're looking to be comfortable. In the case of a vehicle that doesn't have servo assistance and requires really big forces on the pedals from the operator, and there are some agricultural and industrial machines which are still more or less this way, uh, you would see recommendations closer to a knee angle of 135 to 155 degrees. From the diagram, it should be reasonably straightforward to imagine how these requirements come about. If we look at the lower part of the image, we'll see a situation where to generate a very substantial force on the pedal, the operator can push back against the backrest of the seat. And to generate force using that sort of a scenario, meaning trap your body between two surfaces and push it outwards, 135 to 155 degrees as an angle is reasonably effective. Instead, if strong forces are not required, and all the cars out in the parking lot today are like this, if it's really about putting the driver or the in, in a comfortable position, then we adopt a much taller seating position with an angle 105 to 110 degrees, and this starts to look a little bit like the sitting angles of a chair or a desk chair or your sofa at home. And if you think about the development of things like road vehicles, particularly automobiles, if you take a look at a museum, when you visit a museum and look at cars of different ages, you will see a progressive change in design from what you see at the bottom of this slide to what you see at the top. As servo automation has been introduced, we've required less and less physical effort from the driver, and that permitted what used to be in the olden days very low sat sitting position, very close to the ground, very straight out legs, sort of like a Formula One race car. From that sitting position of cars of 50, 80 years ago, most of the cars today will resemble what's shown at the top of the slide because strong forces are no longer required. And as we show, we had shown in the talk about uh, biomechanics where we focused in the section on muscles, muscle tissues, actin, myosin, muscle forces as a function of position and as a function of the speed of the movement of the muscle, we see the same results showing up when we test a person in a machine in a sitting posture. So here's a diagram of the knee angle and on the x-axis and on the y-axis we have in this diagram the amount of force normalized to 100% as a percentage just to make things simple the amount of force the person is producing with their leg when they push onto the pedal and as we see there's a curve it's a crude one because there's very few measurement points in this particular diagram but we see sort of a bell-shaped curve again which looks a lot like the curve we saw for muscle force as a function of the position of the actin and myosin fibers in a previous talk, we see something of a bell-shaped curve where if the legs are too flat and open, can't really make that much force. If they're too bent, when we're trying to actuate, start the pushing, it's hard to start pushing when your knee is really bent. And the best is somewhere in between, which are those angles that we saw on the previous slide. And the same sort of thing happens down at the ankle when we consider the angle of the ankle. In this case, there's a few extra data points on this particular diagram, and we see that bell-shaped curve, the one we saw for percent muscle force in the biomechanics talk. We're seeing it reappear again. Thus, there's an optimum 
angle from the point of view of producing forces to actuate the pedal. Hand operation. Many things, probably most things, and going forward into the future, probably the majority of things will be delegated to these fellows. Again, if we look at the elbow or we look at a finger in isolation, if we measure any part of the upper limbs and use them to actuate some sort of a control surface, we're getting again that sort of similar to Gaussian bell shape curve. We're seeing an optimum at some angle and then we're seeing that if we are too open or too closed, it's really hard to generate the force. So in this particular diagram, we have someone trying to pull something. If they start their pull with the arm all the way out or all the way closed, the forces, which are at the left and right of the diagram, 30 degrees, 180 degrees on this diagram, the forces we can generate are not near the maximum possible for our arm as we start to move instead from more the neutral position, the middle optimum, we see we can generate a lot more force. Very important in human factors and ergonomics to look at these things and say, if we put the steering wheel there, if we put the emergency lever there, if we put the emergency button to actuate there, are we putting it in the place that makes it easier to generate the force to make sure it's properly actuated. And uh, with the upper body, just like the lower body, there's a wide range of recommendations. Here is uh, an example of a series of hand operation forces where we have push, pull, up, down, in, out, and then we have the angle of the elbow, and we can see the numbers we can get. And again, you can see that there's always a happy value, a happy medium in the middle, a happy place, not too far out and not too close, and that would be the best way for the person to be when they need to do it. So we have to design the environment and dimension things to make that possible as much as possible. Now hand operation has a few interesting peculiarities. One of them is this amazing thing here. This fellow is one of the great triumphs of evolution because there's lots of discussion in biology uh, and about the thumb, the reversible thumb, and how that probably changed so much the history of humanity. Some people would claim the frontal cortex of the human brain could only emerge once the thumb was reversed. There's all kinds of uh, speculations, theories, and complexity related to this issue of the inverted thumb. But the, the basic point of interest for us in the field of human factors and ergonomics is simply that the hand has a flexibility of deployment as an end effector, which is vast, which means we can interact interaction design. We can interact with things in many, many different ways using the same hand because we can grab things, we can grip things, we can push or pull things in many different manners and still accomplish the same goal, the same task. For example, on this uh, particular slide we have a set of examples of ways that the hand can be coupled to something, meaning grab it, different ways that we can grab the thing, pull the thing or turn the thing, and accomplish the same goal in all these different manners. And they are vastly different. Some of them involve the tips of the fingers, some involve uh, the full palm of the hand, uh, others have an open posture, others have a more closed posture around, the artifact we're gripping. A designer has to ask questions about the thing we're trying to design given its shape, given its, and we'll talk about this in a, in a future talk, its affordance, affordance, given its affordance which hand grip and which hand contact are most likely to occur. And based on that then we have to dimension the thing and size it and shape it appropriately. Many years ago, working for a European 
automobile manufacturer set of experiments my team ran uh, we found uh, over 12 different ways of shifting gears people would grab the gear shifter in a manual shifting automobile in at least probably more probably as many as 17 or 20 at least 12 or 13 different manners some people would grab the thing from the top some from underneath some just with two fingers depending on how big the person was and where the vehicle had placed the exact location of the shifter knob itself different people of different sizes would grab the thing differently some from the right some from the left some from below a vast array depending also on how tired they were a person early in the morning might shift it one way in the evening they're tired they might sit on top and release some of the weight of their arm onto the piece of the vehicle so the hand brings into play a wide range of design questions which possibly uh, the lower limbs do not create. And in hand operation there's a wide range again of recommendations coming to our help, coming to our assistance. We can grab some of these as designers and say well for my design problem I will adopt this particular criteria. Now other things typical uh, about posture, other design considerations which quite often come into play when you're considering specifically any effects of posture and any design requirements related to posture. One thing that comes into play a lot in work settings where a person is doing something for many hours a day is the question of carpal tunnel syndrome. Poor design of a workplace, a work environment, or a piece of equipment can lead to what's called overuse syndrome. If I have to bend my wrist all the way to the end to do something on my keyboard or to actuate some piece of equipment, I have to be constantly doing this back and forth all day long. By the end of the day, the muscles will be tired, the tendons uh, and the ligaments that are involved in the motion will be highly stressed and there may be signs of inflammation. If this is repeated continuously each day, the inflammation may become chronic, inflammation being the response of, human, of uh, animal tissue to a stress, a mechanical stress actually acting on it. Inflammation is a set of actions the cells take to defend themselves from the stress and part of inflammation can often be uh, changing the shape and increasing the size to try to deflect or push away the source of the stress. Carpal tunnel syndrome is when some uh, unfortunate posture is required repeatedly over long periods of time leading to inflammation and irritation and mechanical stresses in the tissues Pure, also purely material stresses and eventually leading to a chronic condition characterized by pain, discomfort and in some very drastic cases disability. So what happens in the case of carpal tunnel syndrome? The hand, the miraculous tool that it is, amongst its many features it isn't just possible to configure it in many positions and to actuate and to turn or twist in many different ways one of the other great features is the surfaces of the skin of your fingers carries the largest number of pressure sensors in the body the human nervous system has deployed a set of skill, uh, skin receptor sensors to measure displacement and pressure in the skin of your four fingers and in your face, around your mouth, on your lips when you're eating things to check what you're eating, in the hands also to check when you're picking something up to eat. So these are the most sensitive parts of the body, dramatically, orders of magnitude more sensitive. If I feel a certain pressure here, and I feel the exact same one on the backside, 
probably there's an order of magnitude difference in the force I'm pressing with. That's how sensitive, how different the sensitivities are on our body in different places. Given the hand has all these sensory capabilities on the fingers, it means there's a lot of nerves. There's a lot of neurons, of neural tissues that have to reach the fingers to measure the things and carry the signal all the way back up to my brain so I can feel something. That's what tactile perception or pressure sensing is about. So what happens in carpal tunnel syndrome is this enormous vast number of nerve lines, think of it as electric cables in a trunking or in the wall of the building, this large number of communication lines have to pass through a very small space here at the wrist. The wrist in cross section is not very large. And in there, there are some bones and there are some uh, ligaments and there are some tendons and there's a vast number of nerve cells passing through. And in this diagram we see, uh, in this cross section, we see that there's something called the carpal ligament protecting them here coming across the front. It's a protection of all these nerve cells. And then we see a bunch of nerve cells clustered right underneath. Well, if I bend this up and down and up and down, squeezing, because when you turn it, it squeezes. If I keep squeezing what is that very tiny cross section where all those lines are going through, I squeeze, 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 eventually the nerve cells start to resist and inflammation ensues, changes in shape can occur, dysfunction, dysfunction leading to pain. So carpal tunnel is a mechanical stress of squeezing these nervous tissues over and over again until they start to be damaged and until they launch inflammatory responses. Things like using the keyboard are the classic example. Carpal tunnel syndrome was relatively unknown until the invention of the typewriter. It was in the 1950s and 1960s when whole buildings were filled with offices of people working on typewriters, spending a whole day with their hand bent like this back and forth and typing up and down and back and forth. It was only then that this started to show up as a problem and people were showing up at their local uh, GP surgery, going to the doctor and saying, doctor, doctor, my wrist hurts. I don't know what's causing it. What should I do? And over the years, as automation in the office has increased and we've moved from typewriters to personal computers to laptop computers and so forth, the problems only got it worse. And uh, many uh, situations in vehicles, including aircraft, can cause similar uh, circumstances. What are the consequences of carpal tunnel? When it begins, and it's still in its initial phases, if you go see the doctor, the doctor will recommend some form of a splint to keep your wrist from bending. So despite the fact you're trying to use the computer and you probably, without realizing it, bend your wrist, the splint will keep your hand and lower arm fairly level with each other, fairly straight and fairly uh, smoothly consistent with each other. And that may help to reduce the problem because you are mechanically stopping the flexion of the articulation. When the problem though gets worse and progresses, steroids are usually injected uh, directly into that region. Steroids being anti-inflammatory substances which will try to stop the defensive response of the nerve tissues in that area and thus hopefully reduce the change in size because as they get inflamed unfortunately the nerve cells can get larger which squeezes even more and reduces even more the space available so you begin chemically to try to freeze as it were the situation by reducing the inflammatory response if the disease if the problem has progressed too far usually the only remaining option is some sort of a surgical option 
and it's about making the passage bigger by widening it. You have to remove some tissue to give more space to the nerve cells such that they're not so compressed going through there. Now, carpal tunnel syndrome will not happen to everybody. It has a lot to do with how your wrist and arm are shaped. We know some people are bigger, some people smaller, some people have curly hair, some people have straight hair, some have blue eyes, some have brown eyes. We're all slightly different. There's about 1% of our genetic makeup, which varies somewhat from person to person. In that 1%, there's also differences about the size of the wrist. Some people, though, will have a propensity to this problem because their wrist will be rather small and rather constrained already at the start. Thus, any movement can uh, create difficulties. Now, to uh, design equipments that minimize these sorts of difficulties, the first human factors and ergonomics criteria that's usually maintained is seeking in the design of the artifact to maintain a natural wrist angle. So here we have an example. When you hold something, is your hand straight and rigid like this? Are you straight angle or is it slightly inclined? It's slightly inclined, about 70 degrees angle. That is the natural position of the wrist. So if we recognize that's how people are made, and that's what human factors and ergonomics is about. If we recognize how people really are and design the artifact from the point of view of the people and not the point of view of the machine, the car, the airplane, the typewriter, whatever it is, we end up with shapes and designs that look like what we see further down in this image. Typical set of pliers or typical set of snips would be what we see at the bottom two symmetrical or quasi-symmetrical components pinned together in the middle such that you can open and close them. Cheap, easy to manufacture, all kinds of interchangeable, all kinds of very nice characteristics. But the one at the bottom, for all of its uh, commercial and economic advantages, isn't shaped to the body of the people. So the one in the middle, which has this very odd shape, is maintaining the natural angle of the wrist. So carpal tunnel syndrome and many other considerations which designers worry about as part of the design of some artifact or some piece of equipment for people, very important to look carefully at what a person is shaped like and what's their natural movement pattern and try to shape the artifact to the people and not the other way around. That is the logic which takes us to so many of the artifacts we see in the world today. If we look in any online shopping, go on Amazon perhaps and look up some artifacts, some tools, we will see that any kind of tool, any kind of electronic system that interacts with people all kinds of things in vehicles or aircraft or in homes or buildings, we will see over and over again a wide range of what at first glance can seem rather unusual shapes. This particular slide has a wide range of handles, <coughs> some of which are very obvious why they're like that, some a little bit less intuitive, and you can see a whole set of things which are clearly more expensive to make, they're less symmetric, they're less simple from a mechanical point of view, but each of these artifacts is shaped according to some consideration of the typical hand and the typical scenario in which this will be used by the typical person. And ergonomic keyboards and ergonomic mice for computers given the ubiquitous nature of uh, computers in people's lives today. We see lots of ergonomic keyboards and ergonomic mice and ergonomic joysticks and so forth because so many people are using them for so many hours a day. So most of them are fairly carefully designed these days. Now, in terms of classics, I'm just going to show uh, for this particular discussion about posture 
two specific classics. One of them is the classic scissors that uh, wins lots of design awards. You see it in museums, everyone's familiar with it, which is the scissors by Fiskers. Fiskers, 1960s. It may seem surprising today, but up until the middle of the last century, most simple hand tools, whether they be for the office, the home, agriculture, snips to, to, to work, uh, uh, the grapes or, or whatever, most simple hand tools were built uh, to be low cost. They were built to be economically viable. Thus, they were simplified to the point that quite often they weren't very comfortable or easy to use. In a world where we didn't have the luxury of everything being available, everything producible at cheap costs, in, in a world where, where people often didn't have everything they wanted, in a pre-industrial world, the cost of manufacture was prohibitive. By the 1950s, 1960s, middle of last century though, industrial production is ramped up, the post-war economic boom is kicked in, and in most of the industrial countries, the prices of things drop, and we can now afford to introduce more sophisticated, uh, more practical, more useful, more enjoyable uh, artifacts. Fiskers is a great example. It's the first uh, widely produced, there may have been some attempts previous by various manufacturers, but it's the first mass produced uh, set of scissors which is shaped to the human hand. When I'm cutting something, I don't use the thumb or the first fingers in the same way as the last few at the bottom. I squeeze with specific points on specific fingers. Fiskers shaped the handles to accommodate that movement, that motion. It sized the gaps in the handles to work with a 5th to 95th percentile population of individuals. And Fiskers gave a color, the nice bright orange color, which is another aspect of human factors in ergonomics, because scissors are dangerous. You'd be surprised how many people accidentally cut themselves, how many people sit on a pair of scissors after having forgotten where they left it, how many times a child runs into the room and bumps into a scissor without seeing it. Scissors uh, cut, they're dangerous. So uh, Fiskers not just followed the postural recommendations we've been discussing today, but they also added this other aspect, which can seem very trivial today, but at the time actually was somewhat unusual, which is to put a bright, shiny, orange color to the scissor such that we can see it from very far away and we can be careful not to bump into it, misuse it, drop it on someone or bump somebody with it. So Fiskers is an excellent example of classic design, of effective design, and it's very much about posture and to some degree also about warning us semiotically about the danger through the color. And another example of excellent postural design is the very well-known design classic, the Aeron Chair. The Aeron Chair, which is on permanent display at the Museum of Modern Art in uh, New York. This won many design competitions in the early 2000s. Herman Miller is a very well-known manufacturer of office uh, chairs, tables, uh, cabinets, any types of office furniture. They put a lot of effort into this particular design. Don Chadwick, the designer, put a lot of effort into it. It's aesthetically pleasing. It's very pleasing in terms of materials, thermal comfort, and other considerations. But one of its main strengths, and the reason why it's here today in this particular image, is it has a wide range of adjustments to make possible the achievement of an optimum posture for anyone who's sitting in it at their desk doing some sort of work. So, wasn't the first ergonomically adjustable chair 
certainly wasn't the last, but it was one of the most sophisticated of its day, and it was one that integrated these sophisticated adjustments in a way that merged and matched very carefully also the aesthetics, the thermal comfort, and the other aspects of the chair. So here, posture has been given pride of place. It's been announced through the styling and through the shaping. It's been met, it's been provided for, and all of the supporting design around the posture is excellent as well and, and reinforces the message that this chair can be used in a comfortable manner. So with that, I thank you once again for your time and your attention. I hope this uh, material was of some interest and some possible use. Posture is a very important topic in human factors and ergonomics, and I look forward to speaking with you again next week.